Everybody happy in Jesus? You know what? We prayed before the day began upstairs. And I just said to Pastor Hammond, because at 9 o'clock and again today, God is in this building. How many have felt the presence of the Lord in this building? Not emotionalism, as Sue said. Not emotionalism, not worked up uh, anything. You know, the presence of the Lord. Seasons of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. So because we're doing MTI this week, I felt it worked out great. By the way, the young lady who sang the second song, Jesus, I Love You, her name is Hadassah. Everybody say Hadassah. And Hadassah is equal in the Old Testament to the name Esther. And I am going to cover, and you're going to know the entire book of Esther right now. How many would like to learn the whole book right now? Next half hour. All right, we're going to learn it. So, background, context. Let's go way back. Moses went, and under God's power and direction, he led the people of Israel, the Israelites, out of captivity in Egypt, where they had been for 400 years. They wandered in the desert for 40 years because of their unbelief. And then they came up to the Jordan River on the east side, and Moses died, and Joshua took him across to the land that God had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They possessed the land, 12 tribes possessed their allotted spaces, had to fight enemies to get them off, didn't conquer all of them, unfortunately. And, and there they settled and lived. After David and Solomon were kings. After Solomon's time, there was a civil war. So now there were no longer one nation, 12 tribes. There was a northern kingdom, like we had the north and south in the civil war, and a northern kingdom made up of 10 tribes, and a southern kingdom made up of one main tribe, Judah, and a little tribe, Benjamin. That was called Judah. So there were kings of Israel in the north, kings of Judah in the south. This is the time of the prophets. So all those prophets that you read about, they were going and speaking for God in the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom over a period of long time. The northern kingdom was always idolatrous. They followed the example of the Canaanite tribes that were around them. God had warned them. Moses told them before he died, when you go into the land that I'm going to give you, don't you start copying the way the people live. You're, you belong to me. You don't worship their gods. I am the true God. Don't worship those idols. But alas, they did not listen. And they, from the very beginning, were sideways when it came to spiritual devotion to God. So God warned them through prophets like Hosea and others, turn back to God. God loves you. But if you don't turn, then it's going to be pow-pow. So... They didn't turn, and the northern kingdom was invaded, just like God predicted, by the Assyrian Empire, who had taken over a huge swath of land. And they were absorbed into the um, Assyrian Empire. And what the Assyrians did was they took all the leading people and just sent them all over their huge empire. And, uh, and now all that was left was Judah and Benjamin. But Judah at least had Jerusalem. <laughs> but... They didn't listen either. Less than 200 years later, uh, they had some good kings and then some bad kings. God sent prophets to them. What are you doing? I brought you out of Egypt. I will supply all your needs. Don't bow down to these other gods. Why do you do this? That hurts me and it angers me because these are abominations and you're going to learn their practices and, and which are bad and immoral. But they didn't listen either. So finally, now the Assyrian Empire had been conquered by the Babylonian Empire in that period of time. So now the Babylonians came in and they laid siege to Jerusalem. And it got very bad, bad. They were eating um, dead bodies. It got just horrible. And finally, Jerusalem, the walls were cracked down. Nebuchadnezzar was the, emperor, the king of the Babylonians. And they cra cracked down the walls. They went in. They burnt the, the temple, Solomon's famous temple. They smashed it to the ground. 
and they made a mess of everything. And Israel was no more. No northern kingdom, no southern kingdom. And the Babylonians did the same thing. They took the leaders and the people they saw as dangerous and future potential uh, opposition. They spread them all over this vast empire of the Babylonians. So time went on. And just not that long after they had been taken to Babylon, people like Daniel went in that uh, first batch of people they sent over to Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and there you go. They, they went there, and now they were Jews living in a foreign empire. And they, had a, they knew that, that they were different, and they had different uh, practice, one God, not a not hundred, and uh, the ones who cared. And they had food laws and all of that, which were different. So now while they were there in the Babylonians spread out all over, all over the place, Babylon was conquered by the next great empire. The Assyrians were succeeded by the Babylonians and then the Persian empire. When you say Persia, you're talking Iran. Iran, I once was in, I was once in Istanbul in Turkey and I had been invited to speak to hundreds of Christians who had escaped Iran. And they were leaders trying to figure out a way to get back into Iran and spread the gospel, but very, very dangerous, as you can imagine. And I would look at these people and talk to them and fell in love with them, and I would, they had a different look. They, they were not Jewish. They were not um, um, European. They weren't Asian. I just kept... And I was talking to someone, so tell me about the background. Oh, and then they said, you know who we're connected to is Queen Esther. We're the land of Queen Esther, which is what we're going to talk about now. So the Persian Empire conquered the Babylonian Empire. And now the Jews, they were still under the control of whoever. And now the, the king of Persia is over them. And they're assimilated and just all over the place. And, the, and, the, and the, the Persian Empire was even bigger than the Babylonian. They controlled from India, if you know your map, from India to Ethiopia in Africa. Just imagine that. And the king in all his splendor and all of that. So, Esther, Hadassah, begins this way. These events happened in the days, this is Esther 1.1. Happened in the days of King Xerxes, who reigned over 127 provinces, stretching from India to Ethiopia. This is the biggest thing known in the history of, of, uh, of the world in terms of an empire controlling that much space. At that time, Xerxes ruled his empire from his royal throne at the fortress of Susa. That was the capital city in what we would know today as Iran. In the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials from all over the empire. He invited all the military officers of Persia and Media, as well as the princes and nobles of the provinces. You think you've been to a big party? How about this? In the, the, the celebration lasted 180 days. I mean, how much could you eat in 180 days? I'm asking a question here. I am all for festive occasions, but six months? But that's the way they did it back then. And he wanted a tremendous display of the opulent wealth of his empire and the pomp and splendor of his majesty. So, here's the way the story goes. You're going to know the whole book. So, King Xerxes was having that banquet, and then after that banquet, he threw another banquet just for the people in Susa, the capital city, because he wanted them to see the splendor of their, of their king. And while he was there, and they were serving good food, and he had uh, maybe one too many glasses of wine, he got carried away and said, I want you to go and bring in the queen in here, because I wanna show her beauty to everyone. The queen, who had been picked out of all the beautiful women in the whole Persian Empire, her name was Vashti, V-A-S-H-T-I. And he called her in because she was having her bash, her party, 
in a separate place just for the women. You get it, it was a different culture and very misogynist and men and the ladies over there and whatever. So she doesn't tell us why. She says, tell them I ain't coming. <laughs> he can call all he wants. She originally was from Brooklyn. That's why she <laughs> talked like that. She had a little Brooklyn in her. I ain't coming. So he was dissed in front of all his leaders. He was dissed in front of, listen, everybody. Like the queen, he's bragging, wait till you see the most beautiful woman in the world. And she's not even coming. So he was humiliated and he got very angry. So he met with his advisors. He said, what am I going to do? She dissed me in front of everybody. They said, look, this word could get out around the whole empire and the wives could start dissing their husbands and saying, if it's good enough for the queen, it's good enough for me. And they said, no, we can't have that. This will be a rebellious kind of culture. So they said, here's what you should do. You got to set an example or things are going to get out of control. And it's very male oriented, obviously, the culture. So... They said, set her down, depose her, so that everybody will know. That's a no-no. But king, find a new queen. Find the most beautiful woman in all the Persian empire. So the king said, sounds good. So he deposed Queen Vashti. She never saw the king again. And now he went on this search for a new queen. Now there happened to be right in the capital city where he was, a woman named Esther who was Jewish. She was a Jew. And she was very beautiful. The Bible says she was comely in every way, just gorgeous lady. And they spotted her along with lots of others. It was like, you know, who's got talent or the voice or something. It was like a beauty pageant. And they selected her with a lot, a lot of other women. And then they worked on them with uh, um, perfumes and herbs and whatever they did, bath, bathing them and whatever for, for six months before they would even present them to the king. Now, she had a cousin who was much older than her. Her parents died when she was young, and she was raised by a man named Mordecai, who was a Jew, who had a low-level position in the administration of King Xerxes. So Mordecai had told her, no matter what happens in life, no matter whatever, wherever you go, don't tell anyone you're a Jew. Do not say that. So she was under wraps. Nobody knew. So... As time goes on, he makes a selection. And guess who he picks? You got it. Esther is the woman. He calls her now the queen, and she has her own little palace, and she sits on a throne, and she's the queen. But then there's a lot of other women around, and the king is so supreme that you can't approach him. Nobody can walk up and talk to him unless he sees you and he holds out the golden scepter, a rod of authority, which would then mean you can come and talk to me. If you didn't obey that, muerte, you're dead. So everything is looking good. The queen is on the throne, Queen Esther, and Mordecai, who works in the, near the grounds, he comes every day, checks out, and she sees him. She comes out, and he talks to her. How is it going? Because she's like, he's like a dad to her. He raised her. So <clears throat> while this is going on, Mordecai, who has this low position, he hears two high-ranking Persian guys who are in the administration there. He hears them talking about killing the king, an assassination, a coup. He hears it, and he realizes these guys are serious. They're going to kill the king. So <clears throat> he gets to her the next day, and he tells Esther, Queen Esther, Queen, listen, Esther, go to the king and tell him there's these two guys, gives their names. They are going to kill him dead and be, let him be warned. 
She goes and tells the king that. He looks into it. Sure enough, these two bad, uh, guys are bad apples. They were planning an assassination. They're, they're taken. They're arrested. They're done away with. And the name of Mordecai is mentioned, it, written down in the history of King Xerxes' uh, reign as king because of the good deed that he did. And now everything is fine, except... There's a man there who's rising up quickly under the king. He's the top official. He gets to being number two in all of the Persian Empire, and his name is Haman. And Haman, as I said earlier today, to put it in Brooklyn terms, he is a piece of work. <laughs> but he's a piece of hateful, evil work. But he has authority because he's next to the king. He has such a high position that when he's riding through town or going anywhere, it is customary to bow down to Haman because of his high position. But every time he goes by Mordecai, Mordecai being a Jew, he's not going to bow to anyone. And he just looks at him. He's not angry or uh, insolent, but he just stands there. He won't bow. This drives Haman. See, Haman is one of those people, we know them. It's all in us, potentially. He's full of himself. If you're full of a devil, it can be cast out. But if you're full of yourself, you got another whole set of problems. <laughs> and he is full of himself. He cannot stand to be insulted. Not to be noticed, not to be honored. For someone to do him wrong, even the simple act of not bowing down and and. No, he can't let it go. He, in his vocabulary, there is not the word whatever. One of the great words in the English language and attitudes to take that you need the way people act is whatever. Am I correct or not? Because if you take everything serious around you because you're so important, you are the center of the universe, you will go crazy. And he went crazy with hate. It started with a, what he took as an insult, but now it's hate. He not only hates him, he hates him so much that he says, I got to destroy him, but he won't stop there. He won't just destroy him. He wants to destroy every Jew in the Persian empire from India to Ethiopia because he just drives him crazy. That miserable Jew, that Mordecai, he won't bow down. He disrespects me. Every dog has their day. And bow, wow, wow to, uh, to him. So he cooks up a scheme. And he goes to the king and he says, King, there's a people in our empire that are different. You know, they're different. Most prejudice is based, obviously, on pride and ignorance. Prejudiced people are always the stupidest in the room, even if they have PhDs. All prejudice is based on ignorance. You can't dislike a people unless you're stupid, because we're all the same. Just cut open the skin. We all bleed the same kind of blood. Am I correct or not? But Haman has a PhD in hate, and he says, you know, they, 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 don't, they don't worship like we do, and they don't eat certain foods. I offered him a pork chop. He said, no, get out of here. <laughs> King, could anybody be decent who won't eat a pork chop? That's what I want to ask you. And the king says, really? And he makes this real story, and he says, I think they should be totally destroyed. And if you agree with me, I'll give you, uh, it's very hard, the equivalent. Let's say uh, I'll give you 10 tons of silver. I'll make a contribution. And the king, who's not the sharpest pencil in the drawer, he says, yeah, whatever. So now Haman casts lots. Casting lots was a way to like roll the dice, to pick a date where he would pull out his, uh, carry out his scheme. So he cast lots and he cast it in mid-April 
And it came out that next, the following March, 11 months later, the 17th, 18th, and 19th of March, that would be the day that they would proclaim throughout the whole empire that every Jew should be killed. Every child, every wife, every husband, every everybody killed. Now, it took a long time for the runners to get over and the proclamations to be made. That's why they needed time. But on that day, the king gave off his ring, which was a signet ring, like a stamp, and it was stamped. Irrevocable now. Can't go back. On this day, next year, we kill all the Jews. This started with a guy not bowing the way he liked. This is what hate does and prejudice. So it always takes you farther than you want to go. So now Mordecai sees it put up on the bulletin board and he sees what? What? 11 months from now, he's going to wipe out all our people. He goes to sackcloth and ashes and he begins to mourn and pray, won't wear his regular clothes and he's in sackcloth and he's figuring and now it's happening everywhere. The edict goes and the Jewish people see what? It's, it's, in other words, it's written out clear as day that on the 17th, 18th, 19th of March of the next year, they're all going to be wiped out and the, and the king endorsed it. So they're, they're done. It's, it's out of the question. So Mordecai, everyone's praying. All the Jews are praying and mourning and crying, lamenting. So Mordecai gets a message. He can't come in and see her because he's in sackcloth and ashes as a sign of mourning. And no one's allowed in the palace who's dressed like that. But he sends a message to his niece, uh, cousin, who's much younger. And he says, tell Esther... She lives in another world. She lives in a bubble. She's the queen. Tell her what was just proclaimed throughout the whole empire. And maybe for such a season as this, for such a time as this, God made her queen so she could intervene. So tell her she's got to get to the king and say, this is bad. This is wrong. She sends a message back to Mordecai and says, listen, listen, It's not that easy. I can't go in and just step in to talk to the king. Unless he calls for me or he puts out the scepter, I'm not allowed to go there or they'll kill me. So Mordecai sends back and says, listen, if you think you'll escape, you're wrong. God will have to use somebody else to save the people. But just remember, you won't get away You got to go for it. And then she sends back her final message, says, you know what? You're right. In three days, I'm going to walk in there. If I die, I die. If I perish, I perish. But I got to try to save my people. So Haman is so happy. He's just celebrating. And... Now the queen, Esther, is is planning, what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? So the day comes. She tells her her cousin, have the people pray for me. I'm going to fast, and I'm going to go and try in three days, but have them pray. I will not go until they have prayed for three days and fast. So the day comes. She's standing outside, and he, out of nowhere, catches a glimpse and puts his scepter out, which means, come on in. She comes in. Oh, Esther, you're the most beautiful woman in the Persian Empire. I'll give you anything you ask up to a half of the kingdom. What do you want? Tell me whatever you want. And she says, I want for tomorrow, uh, I mean tonight, I want you to come to a banquet at my palace uh, and bring Haman, your, your chief of staff, your number one guy, just you two and me. So they get the word to Haman, and they tell Haman, Haman, tonight you're going to a dinner at the queen's palace. Just you and little Kingy and the queenie, and it's going to be just a wonderful little get-together. So he's boasting to his wife and his friends, guess who got invited? 
to the queens. Like, hello. So they go and they sit down and the king says to her, what would you like, Esther? Oh, queen, up to half my kingdom, just tell me what you want. And she says, I want you to come back tomorrow at night for another banquet. And he says, that's all you want? That's all I want, you and Haman. Come back. So I certainly will do it. So now Haman's even happier. He goes home and he's bragging, listen, I'm invited again, just me. Think of the honor that I have that the king and the queen are dining with one person, me. So as he rides back to his house, he sees Mordecai. And as he's riding in his chariot, he sees Mordecai. Everyone else bows the knee and Mordecai just stands there. This sets him off. He can't take it and he can't wait. He can't wait till next March. He said, I'm gonna kill him now. I'm gonna go to the king and use my influence. That man is gonna be dead. He's gonna be dead. So he tells his servants and all that. I want you to build a 70 foot high pole so that he can be impaled on it and hang up there and everybody can see him with the pole coming through him. It was, it was a, like a type of a crucifixion. I'll show him not to bow to me. So he's plotting that and the workers start. The king goes to bed that night and he can't sleep. He's restless and he gets up and it's three, four in the morning and he asks his assistants, I, I wanna read something. I want the history of my reign. I wanna read about everything that's happened since I've become king. They bring it to him and he's reading the recorders that, which were an important position back in those days. And he's reading and he reads about Mordecai, the Jew who protected him from the two assassins and all that. And he asked the men around him, what did we ever do for Mordecai? What honor did we give him? What reward, what, what public display did we do for him? They said, nothing. Nobody saved my life. He says, oh, I got to think of something. I got to really honor him. So in an hour or so, Haman uh, uh, comes and uh, he says to Haman, um, later that day, they're going to have that banquet, second banquet. He says, Haman, if I really want to honor someone above everybody else in the kingdom, what do you think is the right way to do it? So Haman says, Oh, yeah. This is for me. He says, what I would do, king, in my own humble opinion, I would get a robe that you wear, put it on him, a white horse, a display of power around him, sitting on a, this stallion, and I would have one of your assistants lead him through the city and just proclaim everywhere, look at the man the king has honored. Behold, the most honored man by the king. And the king hears this and he says, Haman, that is the greatest idea. Go get a horse and find Mordecai and put Mordecai on the horse and with everything around it. And you know what? Do me, do me a solid. Haman, bring the horse yourself. Walk with the horse and proclaim everywhere you go. Behold the man. Can you imagine what that was for Haman? He probably was choking the whole day. He was outside. Behold, behold the man that the king honors. So now after doing that, and Mordecai is like, where did this come from? So now they, he goes home to his wife before the dinner date. And he says, she's had a go today, honey. He went, not good. This was not a good day. Well, what happened? And she, he tells her what happened and what he had to do for Mordecai. And his wife and his friends kind of read the tea leaves and they said, this is not gonna have a good ending for you, Haman. <laughs> if you were leading his, him around on a horse and you were planning to kill him, not a good beginning. Well, it's time to go. 
He's got to go to the banquet. So he goes, and there at the banquet, the king once again asked the queen, what do you want, Esther? Up to half the kingdom, I'll give you anything. She said, listen, O king, I wouldn't even bother you with this request. It was just that you would put me as a slave and my people as a slave. I wouldn't even bother you. But there's someone who wants to kill me, your queen, and all of my people. And for no reason, he stands up at the, just gets like mush it up and just gets up and says, what? Who would do that? Try to kill the queen and all your people? Who did that? And she goes, him. <laughs> Haman. Well, now Haman just begins to get real small. And the king can't take the anger he feels, so he walks out into the garden area outside the, the queen's uh, palace. He's fuming. Haman realizes that his goose is cooked. So he goes to her and kneels, but she's laying on a couch, which is the way they ate. And he kneels and says, please, please, I just... I lost my, my grip. I had a difficult childhood. I've been <laughs> eating too many carbs. It's affected my mind. He's trying everything. And then she just refuses to listen. So he climbs up on the sofa with her and maybe slipped. And now his arms and hands are on her person. And the king walks back into the room. And the king says, what? You can read it in the Bible. You're gonna sexually assault my, the queen, in front of me? And immediately, one of his assistants came, a eunuch, and put a cloth hood over his head. I don't know much about Persian culture, but when they put a hood over your head, <laughs> this is not a good sign. How many say amen? It's not gonna be good. He condemns, he, he doesn't know what to do. He's so angry. And he says, I want this man executed. And one of his assistants said, listen, I have an idea. I saw them building a 70 foot high pole. <laughs> he says, impale him on it. And Haman died on the very pole that he had built to kill Mordecai. So, now they still have a problem because that March date is still on the calendar. And he can't retract it because it was with his seal. So he said, no, I'm gonna make another proclamation. Warn all the Jews throughout the kingdom that on that day, those days, they can fight back, be prepared, organize. Anyone comes near them, they can fight back and, and, and they're not gonna be slaughtered. They can fight back and get organized. And when the day finally came, the Jews were so happy that God had gave them the warning and protected them that all throughout the empire, they were preserved and they won the battles, battles all over. And in the, in the capital city, Susa, all hell broke loose and, and Haman's 10 sons, boy, if the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, if there's a lot of applesauce that day because all 10 of them were killed. And she stayed the queen, and that's why those men from Iran told me, no, pastor, we're Queen Esther's people, the Christians from Iran. So now to this day, on April March 17, 18, and 19, the Jews celebrate, the, the observant ones, a holiday called Purim, which means lots, because that's what Haman did to kill them, but God turned what was evil for good. And they celebrate it like our Christmas. They give presents to each other, celebrating what God did through Queen Esther. So I leave you with this. Why would God put such a story in the Bible as part of scripture, along with Psalms, Proverbs, Matthew, Mark, Romans? Just two things. Number one, 
How demonic is hate? I'm not talking demons now. I'm talking hate. Hate like some of you have in your heart toward people that you don't like or a different race. How vicious is hate? When you take hate into your bosom, that fire, you have Haman's spirit. You have Haman's spirit. And what's the history of the world? How many hundreds of millions of people have died in wars? Hundreds of millions since the beginning of time. And what were they fighting against? Somehow hate was, was engendered. Somehow hate got stirred up. And now you're just going to kill. What made Germany the, the, the most advanced country in Europe in the 1920s and 30s? Uh, what would make them end up killing 6 million Jews? Eight. Hate, hate, hate. What makes the, this country the worst war? I mean, the more people died in the Civil War than all the other wars put together. What was that about? It was prejudice and hate against black people, slaves that didn't ask to be brought here, but they were brought here. Okay? And Southern preachers were pounding the Bible like I am today, trying to justify in 1830, 1840, 1850, we got to keep America safe and whatever. And it was just a cover-up for hate, prejudice. And black preachers playing the black race card and their black anger and, and not wanting a white person within 100 yards of their church. Don't tell me that's not so. I know it's so. I've been told that by the people involved. And white ministers wanting to appeal to the worst, lowest part of the white uh, psyche and blacks. And then there's pro uh, hate against Asians and then hate among Asians, the Japanese, the Chinese versus the Koreans, hate. Hey, there's black tribes in Africa that live 50 miles apart. They split maybe 300 years ago and now they kill each other at any chance. And they're the same race, it's hate. And people then go to church and act like you can go to church and be a Christian and hate. Now they say, no, you can't do crack cocaine. You can't be shooting up heroin. You can't be living a life of a pervert or a immoral life sleeping around. But a little hate, hey, who's to say? You know, I, I, well, just to, to forget the race, just the election in our country. I talk to people now, they can't even hide their hate. They, they don't disagree with someone. They hate the person. They hate people. They hate re Democrats. They hate Republicans. They hate uh, uh, Ms. Harris. They hate Trump. They don't disagree. They hate. It's like cancer. It'll eat you up. There'll be nothing left. I'm telling you all that. You know how many white people have come in this church over the years and visited here from Staten Island or someplace, some prejudiced people and said, you know, I like your preaching and the music, right? And, uh, and but, but, you know, to be down here with these people. Exactly. And I tell them, hey, see the door? It says exit. You can go right over there. Just go out, make a left, go in the subway. You know how many black people, members of our church are tribulated? I like that word, tribulated. <laughs> They're tribulated by their own relatives who say, I can't believe you sold out and go to the church. How do you like being in the plantation there with Master Jim? <laughs> well, of course, of course, she knows that. Of course, people in our choir. And they are going to other churches and think they're Christians. Let, let me just give you la one last word here. This will be good for all of us. For this is the message you have heard from the beginning, John says, who is the closest to Jesus possibly. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. He was jealous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you because they hated Jesus. We know that we have passed from death to life. We know that we're Christians because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Hey, listen, you got death hanging over you with your hate. 
You go to church, speak in tongues, run up and, down, up and down the aisles, shout glory, memorize the whole New Testament. Death is over you. Because, stop, you're a hater. You're a hater. And remember what the Bible teaches. There's no in-between, love or hate. There's no, I don't care for that person. That's not found in the scripture. You either love someone and want the best for them and would protect them, or you're hating them. And imagine the angels when they hear our nonsense and see this cancer of hate, and they know how we've been, and yet God forgave us. So I want to ask you something. Let me get my arms around this. God is perfect, but he loves everyone. And you're a sinner, but you, you don't love everyone because they're not up to your standards. So get me, just fill that in. Fill me in on that. I want to understand that. God is holy and loves everybody. And you and I are a mess, but we're allowed to hate certain people. Be careful, you're gonna wake up in a place in eternity you never dreamt of. Because the Bible says anyone who lives in hate lives in death. Death, not drugs, not just that, not pornography, not those things, they slay their thousands. I'm convinced now, this is the test of everything, love. If I speak with the tongue of men and angels and have not love, I am nothing. If I can prophesy and heal the sick and I understand all mysteries, and have not love, it's for nothing. Nothing, it's nothing. With your black hate, your white hate, your Latin hate, your Asian hate, or someone who did something wrong to you and you got your little book and inside are all the names of people that you hate. <laughs> did you know what I met, I saw someone on TV the other day in the political realm. They're so full of hate, they could, their face said hate. <laughs> the way their lips were curled, the way they spoke, it was hate. It was hate speech, hate speech. So look, if you don't wanna be a Christian, hey, whatever. It's a free country, don't be a Christian. But please, don't say you're a Christian and hate people. Don't do that. You know what it does? It's a, listen, it's a terrible advertisement, terrible advertisement for Jesus Christ. The biggest detriment right now to Christianity, I'm convinced, in this country are Christians. As bad as the culture is, it's Christians, because they talk, they talk smack. And God is good, boom, all the time. <laughs> oh, that miserable. I got a letter from some West Indian lady months ago when we were starting this, or some time ago, we were starting these Spanish meetings, trying to help them. What are you helping those people for? They don't pay your tithes. We don't need them around. I'm ashamed that that person even came to our church. So I just want to clear my soul. I want God to rip out every shred of hate in my life. How many are with me? Come on, wave your hand at me if you want. Every shred. Now, we can't do it ourselves, but God can do it because God is love. Haman stands for hate. As I was going out, uh, Jeffrey, you come. As I was going out, someone said, if you just add a T-E to Haman, it would be hate man. He was the hate man. Imagine, he went from just one guy insulting him to let's kill all of them. Think about that next time you talk behind someone's back ugly about them. Think about it. God forbid... God forbid, God forbid we get into hating. Hate is very popular. Ministers can build a following based on hate. Oh yes, come on, you and I know certain religious leaders. They're based on hate and people who are full of hate follow them because hate loves hate. But not for us. When Jesus was on the cross, he said, Father, kill him. What did he say? Are you sure? Forgive them because they know not what they do. And he was perfect. And they were killing him. Last thing. What in the world is the power of prayer? The, the Hebrews were dead. The Jews were dead. When he put that signet ring down, and they picked the date of, of March 17, 18, 19. 
They're dead. I said they're dead. They're gone. Wait, listen, Mordecai, get up. You're wasting your time crying to God and mourning and humbling yourself. You're Jews, Jews throughout the kingdom, stop. It's over. Just accept it. There's things in life you can't change. God is on the throne. No. They were like, no. You're not going to kill those children. Oh, God, we can't do anything. Imagine they had no power, no army, no weapons, no money in comparison to those in charge. And prayer brought a stop to the whole thing. Listen, whatever God can do, prayer can do. Because prayer links you up with the power of Almighty God. And without and with God, nothing is impossible. Look at me, look at me. The thing you're facing today that's breaking your heart, that is impossible to solve. Just, it's impossible. Don't give up. Call on God. Call on God. God can do anything. The highest mountain, he can get us over it. You know, some of you are living and accepting certain things which could be prayed right out of your life or for your children. If you would only get serious. Last thing here. Remember how they prayed, though. It was no mental prayer. Lord, well, basically, I'm fine today. I wish you could help me in a few things and all that. No, it was from su corazón. You will seek me and you'll find me when you seek for me with all of your heart. In the day of trouble, call upon me and I will answer you. What a lesson the book of Esther is. They overcame the plot of Haman and everybody else all by through prayer. They had no other weapon but prayer. And then when he saw Queen Esther, he put the thing out because God had put that in his heart. God can work in other people's lives. The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. He can change things for you. How many need today something like, I mean, you just need something so big, you haven't broken through, you just need God to come through and answer this big thing in your life. Maybe you don't even share it with others, personal, spiritual, financial, a child, but I mean, it's, it's like a, a Haman hanging over you. You can only pray them out, pray it through. Anybody here have that? Something facing you? Get up out of your seat and come up here. We won't even pray until you get here. Come on. Anybody here say, Pastor, I believe what you preach. I believe what the Bible says. I believe that when we call, he said we would, he would answer. Up in the balcony, you got to humble yourself. How long are you going to go without praying? What are you going to do? Taste my sermon and see if you like it? I didn't preach it for that reason. I'm trying to get somebody desperate. I'm trying to shake somebody's bones up. Come up and let God know, God, I can't live with the situation that is. You got to intervene. That's how they prayed. You come up. Where, where, where are you going to go outside? Where, where are you going to run? Where are you going to run to? Get something to eat? Where, is that as important to you as calling on God? Let's sing that song. Choir. Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior. He
That means I need you, God. I believe you, God. Oh, God. Everybody stand in the building. Stand and sing with us. coming in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. You who helped Mordecai and the Jews thousands of years ago. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Oh God, please help my friends, help my brothers and sisters. Help us. You know the cry inside of us. You know what we need. We don't have to express it. You're not interested in the words. You're interested in the heart that goes up to you. If anyone here in the front is not a born-again Christian, let them confess their sins and their need of a Savior and put their trust in you, Jesus, Son of God, who died on the cross for our sins. You paid the price. It's finished. Help them to accept what you did for them. But for all of us, God, hear our humble cry. People behind me have a cry, Lord. I can feel it. I know it. In front of me, up in the balcony, haven't come forward, but they have a cry, God.
Jesus. Oh, Father, help us. Lord, I pray you'll remove every seed, every stump, every root of hate, bitterness. Rip it out of us in the name of Jesus. Let us be flooded with your love for all people of all backgrounds, all colors, who disagree with us, agree with us. It doesn't matter. How could you love them and not us love them? Save us from fake religion, fake Christianity. That's cultural or emotional, intellectual only, but not a heart of love. And now, God, for every wayward son or daughter, every financial need, every spiritual assault by Satan, we break through in Jesus' name today. We speak the name of Jesus. We speak the name of Jesus over every fear and anxiety, depression, emergencies. Thank you, Jesus. Just lift both your hands up now. Let's just sing the verse and the chorus one last time. Then we'll just miss. Pass me not, O people help generosity to spring up the first time visitors in the welcome center and the 50s give them the sweetest fellowship Lord and the ladies going up to the fifth floor God just thank you for this has been such a sweet day Lord in your presence we so appreciate you visiting us today Lord without you we have church but with you we have God we have everything we need Lord so Get everyone home safely in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Give someone a hug. Give someone a handshake.